Well, hello everyone for joining us early this morning. Hope you all have a coffee with you. Uh, I do. <laughs> this session, we're going to be talking about how you can add mobile support to your uh, existing Brad Studio applications. Probably you've heard about FileMonkey. Hopefully you have, because it has been around for quite a few years. But we, uh, I tend to see that um, a lot of Delphi or Brad Studio users, they tend to focus a lot in the VCL ecosystem and they don't pay much attention to the VCL, uh, sorry, to the FileMonkey. And I think that's a, uh, it's a shame because uh, most of people think that they need to rewrite their whole application because obviously maybe you've been developing your application for many, many years. And then you think that you need to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. And that's, I would say that's not the right approach because uh, what you can do is to give extra functionality to your applications using FileMonkey. So you can keep your VCL uh, that has been polished and it has no bugs and is, is working perfectly. Uh, but you can create an extra um, application to give functionality that maybe you're not capable uh, of using uh, VCL. So this is a, a bit of the first idea I wanted to explain to you is the few examples we're going to see today about this topic and also a brief introduction to to FileMonkey in case you haven't used it yet um so yeah that's well uh, that's pretty much the, the agenda we're going to talk about why it's important to add uh, mobile to uh, your applications add things to take into consideration and how you can get ready for mobile uh and what's the right tooling uh, you, you should choose. Also a quite important topic is mobile and data, st uh, data storage. Uh, so because obviously applications need to, well, most of them, not all of them, but most of them need to store information uh, in the device itself. So that implies some legal issues because maybe you're storing sensible data uh, and we need to be sure that we store that correctly. And then I have a ton of demos. Uh, hopefully, we'll have time to show you, but uh, we, will, we will go through them and we'll see how the time goes. And then, obviously, we will have some time for uh, Q&A at the end. OK, so why it's important to add mobile to your application? Well, you, have the, you see that picture on the right, and you can see it straight away, because every single person has one of those in their pockets. And that's a very, very, very powerful uh, tool. Uh, uh, we have this critical mass of uh, what this acronym stands for, bring your own device. Uh, and it's because every single person has one. And that's uh, that's very, very powerful. And we need to take advantage of that. Uh, obviously, a desktop application, you can we can have a long conversation about what's more comfortable to work with, if you prefer like a big screen and with your keyboard, et cetera. But the fact that everyone has a phone, it's something you cannot avoid. And if you're not there, it's something to really think about. And in case you are more like a, a business focused application, then it's also very important to offer them a holistic solution, which means that you're giving them a rounded uh, uh, solution to for your product, and they can use it in, in multiple places. And also, that leads us straight away to customer stickiness, which means that the more uh, services or products of your company uh, this uh, client is using, the more complicated it will be to to move to to a competitor. So the, the it, it makes your customers a, a stick much more, and because you're already uh, a user of Delphi Radar Studio, but the, the, the risk is very low and also the cost because you don't need to hire an extra team for developing a, a mobile application. You don't need to purchase any extra licenses or anything because FireMonkey comes with every single uh, uh, edition of Rad Studio. And this is also something that uh, I've been talking about with a lot of customers. Uh, because, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, a lot of people still think, uh, and it's true, that you have a desktop application and, and it's more comfortable to work on a daily basis. But th that's not the right approach. Because, for example, a phone can give you uh, functionalities that you don't have on a desktop application, which for obviously is portability, <laughs> one of the major ones. But you also have a camera. 
So uh, you can take advantage of that camera that, uh, and give uh, extra features to your software through through phones. And uh, well, if you don't take all these things into consideration, your competitors will. So that's also something to keep in mind uh, that uh, the market is constantly changing and, and more and more um, uh, companies are offering mobile solutions. And customers take that also, uh, they, they keep that in mind that they want to uh, have the, the, the application, the mobile application is straight on their phones and, and they really value that. So how do we get ready for mobile? Well, um, there are going to be a few changes. If you're used to the standard, uh, let's say, Delphi Brother Studio um, environment, you're going to be probably having a, a bunch of, uh, of desktop and laptops, and then you will connect to the database through the network. Uh, but now we're opening this data to the internet, which obviously sounds a bit scary. But uh, we have to do it right, and we need to change some of the infra infrastructure um, in 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 the company or the all your customers' company. Um, so th th that's what I was talking about. We have local versus remote. Um, now we need to not publish the whole database because obviously that's not the right approach. But um, we need to uh, expose some of that data securely on the internet. Um, but there's another option uh, that is a bit more niche, but that we've seen a uh, few successful um, uh, cases. For example, um, we have this concept of which is called app veteran that could go through a uh, cable, but it's more convenient, use it through Bluetooth. For example, you can see or, or imagine a doctor uh, carrying a laptop uh, with Wi-Fi connection around the hospital but they want to take a few pictures of, I don't know, uh, some uh, conditions or wounds or, and, and put that in the, in the, in the patient uh, profile. So they, they use the phone to take the pictures and uh, through Bluetooth, that pictures send the straight to the VCL application and then stored in the database. So that's an, a different approach, um, not as powerful, obviously, as having a fully independent application, but maybe it's something you could uh, take into consideration because um, it, it works very, very well. And some other customers have decided to just go uh, all in with the cloud and move all their infrastructure to the cloud and, and use Azure or AWS. Um, that's not another approach. So you don't need to have anything on premise anymore. You move everything to the cloud and then obviously you have already that uh, open to the internet. But uh, I have to say, this is quite a, um, an extreme case. I'm not a big fan of moving everything because that implies a lot of changes. So we have solutions to expose just partially your data on the internet. And also, uh, because we're exposing this data to the internet, uh, we need to take in, uh, we need to think about data security and, and risk uh, mitigations as well. Um, and one of the key factors of FireMonkey is that the date, uh, the application itself is compiled. So we have a binary that we're putting in, in, in the user's phones. It's not an interpreted uh, language like, let's say, JavaScript, for example. Um, a web app is very important as well. I'm not going to lie. Um, a lot of people want the website, but uh, after all, we're sending all that source code to your customers uh, or to our user base. And that's it. It's true that nowadays with tools uh, like Webpack or Feet, you, you kind of compile the code, even though it's not compiled, it's more like uh, obfuscated. But still, we're providing some code um, and that could be analyzed by uh, hackers or stuff like that. And it's with FireMonkey, you, you provide the binary fully compiled. So that's way more secure than uh, using uh, solutions for creating applications like could be like Cordova or Capacitor that you just embed the website inside an application. We will talk about that later in a bit. And time to market. Um, obviously, FireMonkey is multi-platform, so you don't need to uh, 
develop two in the independent applications because I'm assuming you're going to aim for both uh, major um, platforms, which is which are iOS and Android. Um, and with FireMonkey, you can create the application not only for Android and iOS, but also for Windows, Mac OS, even Linux, uh, with the same exactly same uh, uh, code base. And because you know the tool already, it's not like you need to learn. If you're a small company, you don't need to learn uh, new technology like Swift or, or Kotlin or Java for developing the, the Android or, or iOS application. And again, uh, the total cost of ownership and technical debt you're going to have with a FireMonkey application is much, much lower because uh, as I like to say, it's not only about creating the application, but also maintaining the application. So if you create an, a native application with uh, Swift for iOS or Kotlin for uh, Android, maybe you can uh, uh, assign a lot of resources to those projects. But once you have the applications, obviously you're gonna, uh, you will want to add extra features to that application in the future. And that implies uh, adding those features in two different projects and having two teams that they need to communicate between each other to implement them in, in the same way. And then you have to debug uh, two different projects as well. So all that adds up in the future because uh, it's much, much uh, cost, uh, cost efficient to have just one uh, code base and work on that. And user experience and scalability, uh, FileMonkey uh, has a system that uh, detects the application, or sorry, the, the platform automatically and adapts the UI to the application where it's been running. So if you're on an Android, you will get an Android fill application. Same thing for iOS, Windows, et cetera. We will see examples in a bit. So is that something you don't need to be worried about when you're developing? The application just will look as a platform where it's been run. Um, you can change that as well, uh, because I've had a few questions in the past, uh, because we have this trend now that applications are looking identical regardless of the platform they're being run. It is all this UX user experience thing. Uh, for example, if you open Spotify uh, on Android, it's identical to iOS Spotify. Well, you can do that as well with FileMonkey. Uh, we, ha we have the style box where you can customize your uh, components and, and make them look the way you prefer and on each platform individually or in all platforms at the same time. Uh, but yeah, you, you will have to do that uh, by yourself um, because the default behavior in FireMonkey is platform uh, aware. So it will adapt based on the platform. So how to choose the right tooling? Well, let's talk brief, uh, briefly about the options out there. Obviously, we're not gonna talk about all of them in much detail, but just briefly. Uh, on the left of this chart, we have the native tools. Um, so the pros are obviously you're going to get native performance because you're uh, developing uh, specifically for that platform and you will have as well native uh, user experience and fully secure because it's compiled code. Uh, and But the cons, uh, I've been already mentioning those, you have, you're going to need multiple teams developing for each platform. It's going to be higher uh, development cost, and also you will have multiple code bases. And on the other side, you have the web-based tools, um, which uh, the process is you just need one team because it's going to be uh, JavaScript-based uh, uh, probably. Uh, so that's going to be much lower cost, and you're going to be able to be in the market much faster. But on the cons, uh, you're not going to have a native uh, UX experience. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's not going to be as secure because after all, we're providing the, the source code uh, or a big chunk of our source code with the application and you, you will get a scripted performance. Um, there are famous solutions out there to create ap applications with uh, JavaScript. Uh, it used to be called Tova, but now I think they changed the name to Capacitor. And there's a, some other extra ones. What you pretty much do is you get your website and you embed it inside uh, an application for Android and iOS. But I've been working with those technologies and it's quite complicated, mostly when you want to access the APIs of the phone. 
So if you want to access the camera, uh, if you want to ac uh, access, let's say, the uh, touch ID or the, or the uh, fingerprint reader, it's always a lot of caveats when it comes to this technology. And with uh, Find Monkey, which we can see here that lands beautifully in the middle, um, you're going to get native performance because it's compiled code. You're going to have native UX because Fire Monkey is platform uh, aware, it's secure, and you're going to need just one team, uh, which implies lower dev cost and much fast time to market as well. So this, we have the best of both worlds in just one solution. OK. Um, this, um, we're not going to go through all this uh, crazy chart here, but just want to briefly explain as well how the FireMonkey technology works, because um, it sounds a bit like magic. Um, so at, at, on the left, we have the, the platform, uh, each platform, uh, how layers, let's say, how, how they work and how they access the, after all, to the uh, device APIs. But on the right, um, the, the, let's focus on, on this one. Um, we have a single project, so it's going to be uh, a DPR or a DPROC, uh, as usual. And you can develop with Pascal or C++. And, but then we have the FileMonkey layout. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Hopefully, you do. Uh, we have the FileMonkey layout. And this is the, uh, the the most important one, which is the one that detects when you compile to uh, for which platform you're compiling. So if we go to Android, then uh, uh, the Android variant will take um, will uh, analyze uh, the available APIs and then it will access straight away to the resources of the device. Same thing with iOS, same thing with Windows, etc. So for example. Um, you have um, uh, you want to access the camera. Then the only thing you need to do is to drop the component of the camera, uh, nothing else, and use uh, camera dot activate equals true, and then uh, the application will access the camera. You don't need to be concerned or, or be worried about if I'm on this platform or on that platform. The FireMonkey layout will take that, uh, will do the, all the heavy lifting for you. Uh, and same thing with the touch ID or the uh, fingerprint reader uh, or face ID as well. Uh, you don't need to be worried about which system the phone is using. It will be done automatically if it's available. So yeah, that's, for me, it's one of the most uh, productive ways of coding because uh, in the past I've been working with uh, uh, other technologies and it's usually quite complicated to access uh, this kind of resources and, and multiple platforms. Mobile and data, as I mentioned before, is quite a in, um, serious topic. Mostly if you're going to cache uh, data locally in the phone. So obviously, we need some sort of database or some sort of uh, XML or some, some fast way to store the information. Um, yeah, I usually recommend to have a, a database because you're going to have a, a flexibility of using FireDAC as well, because FireDAC is compatible with FireMonkey, so you can use exactly the same set of components. But obviously, we need an embedded database. And uh, we strongly recommend you to use Interbase to go. Uh, it's true that there are alternatives. You could use uh, SQLite, for example, which is very, very popular uh, among um, mobile applications. But interface to go offers something that uh, SQLite uh, is not as simple uh, to achieve, which is encryption. Uh, you can encrypt the data uh, at rest, so in the device itself, without the need of many configurations or extra hacks to, to encrypt the data. Uh, you can even go to multiple encryption keys. So, uh, depending on, or for example, you can encrypt a specific column, so you can uh, encrypt a specific table. You don't need to encrypt all the data. This is crucial, mostly if you're storing um, sensible data. It, uh, let's come back to that example I was talking about with a with a doctor. And the, uh, imagine that you're developing an application for a hospital or a health health center. Obviously, you're going to be storing uh, locally in the phone as cache some. Uh, critical information from patients. What happens if the doctor loses that phone 
So now, uh, now we have that mini database with, of uh, cache data lost in the wilderness, and we need to be sure that if, if that's uh, taken by mm, someone not very nice, they could extract all that data from the from the database. So that's what happens when you're using not a, a fully uh, secure database. And obviously that could imply massive fines from uh, Europe or the US because we all know this uh, acronyms that we can see here in the background, the GDPR and all these that we're very scared of because if we don't fulfill those, we're going to have massive fines. So this, I mean, it's not like I want to scare you or anything like that. It's just that it's something that uh, usually you see people forgetting about that we um, we have the backend or database very very secure, but then we send that data to the to the phones and then we don't encrypt that. So that's something very important as well. And just take a look at the interface to go, because um, and and the, even in the server side, you could de uh, define uh, multiple uh, encryption levels for users, uh, specific roles, etc. And it's true that is. Um, uh, one of the very few um, databases that is absolutely cross-platform. So you, it's compatible with every single platform with, for Windows, for Mac OS, for iOS, for Android, and, and for Linux as well. And it's embedded. You don't need to uh, install any extra service in the phone. So it just uses the libraries to access. And it's very, very simple to deploy. And on the server side, it has a very, very cool feature as well, which is called change views. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, it allows you to, um, let's say, because we know that, for example, phones, they're on paper, they should be connected to the internet constantly, but obviously, uh, signal drops sometimes, so we lose that connectivity with our backend. But with change views, what we can do is we can offer some sort of offline mode to the user so they can keep working. And once it connects to the server, that data will sync uh, uh, and it will be sent to the server. Obviously, we need to analyze uh, the data in the back end to verify if there's any collisions with other users and stuff like that. But it's a very, very cool technology that uh, in case you're going to have, you need a higher bit, um, a, a, a lot of users accessing your data at the same time is a technology that definitely is worth to take a look at. Okay, enough talking. I think I've uh, spoken enough. Uh, let's jump on the demos. Okay, we have here um, Red Studio. And the first demo I want to show you, um, uh, because I, I assume that you are all aware that um, uh, Red Studio 12 is going to be launched uh, fairly soon. We don't have an official date yet, but it's going to be launched very soon. And I don't know if you've been keeping track uh, of the new features that are going to come uh, with uh, uh, version 12, but we have uh, a full integration of Eskia for Delphi. That's going to be a massive change when it comes to performance and options that use in, in FireMonkey applications, and also VCL because the ski is compatible with VCL as well. Um, and this is an open. It started as an open source project that was on GitHub. Uh, it was developed by a very very talented uh, Brazilian team, uh, but it, it worked out well and that amazingly that um, Embarcadero decided to implement it natively uh, inside by the studio itself with some extra functionality because obviously we have access to uh, lower layers of the of the IDE. So it's, uh, it's going to work uh, even better. But uh, SKF for Delphi will still be uh, available. Uh, but um, now we're going to offer it natively. And in case no one uh, or some of you haven't heard about it or, or haven't been playing around with it, I'm going to open uh, a demo that uh, this is uh, version 11. So I want to clarify that this uh, I'm, I'm still in 11.3 here. But because the skier has been available already, you can get a, 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 an idea of what is coming to 12 as well and, and how this will change uh, things for FireMonkey in case you are already working with it. So this is a very cool demo that you can download. Um, and you can download this already and, and play around with it. You can see, for example, when I open the um, 
application. We have these battery smooth uh, applications that are called LOTI. They are all vector based. This is the, my favorite uh, feature by far, which is now we're going to be able to use SVGs in, uh, in FireMonkey. In case you don't know what an SVG is, it's, uh, it's like an image, but it's uh, vector based. So it doesn't matter the resolution or the size, it's always going to look uh, per, uh, pixel perfect. And we're going to see a few examples in a second. So for, um, as you can see, this demo, it's massive because not only we have all these options, but now when you access the, de the option, you have more options. So we could spend hours here talking about this demo. But feel free to go to GitHub and search Delphi, uh, Skia for Delphi and try it out already because it's going to be very, very, very similar what you're going to find in version 12. So for example, we have this animated uh, image um, that we see this rocket. This is a Lottie animation. We're not going to go into much detail how to accomplish this. But it's a very cool system that has been used widely on the internet and uh, in applications. Probably you've heard about Telegram. So all the those very cool stickers that uh, come in Telegram, are the, the animated ones that uh, developed using Lottie. And we can obviously maximize this. And I don't know through uh, the streaming if you will see that the quality is exactly the same one, uh, regardless of the resolution of, of, the, of the window. And also talking about Telegram, here we have um uh, uh quite funny uh sticker that it has been taken from the open source telegram stickers and again if i maximize this you can see that it still looks great obviously this is uh uh thanks to the uh skia integration skia by the way is developed uh, by google it's a technology that is widely used in Chrome and multiple other solutions, and it has become pretty much the, the, the standard. Um, just to see if a few extra well, labels are going to be also a big, big change, because now we can have, uh, it it's more like a web-based uh, idea. Now we, have we can load our own fonts, and we can work with all the font uh, basis and also even mix them in the same label. And again, obviously, this is a font, so it's um, uh, you can resize that as well and adapt it automatically. Uh, and the one I wanted to show you, well, the SVG I was talking about, the SVG, if we access, for example, the Delphi logo, this is a, an SVG, so it's not a PNG or a JPEG. If we maximize this, we can see that it still looks perfect. So imagine this for a mobile application. Now, all the icons and everything, they don't need to be a PNG and have them adapted uh, to based on the resolution of the phone. You just drop an SVG, and you don't need to prepare multiple versions of the same image for different resolutions. But the, uh, the, the cool bit of SVGs as well is you can edit, edit them. So because this is, after all, uh, a vector, you can just granularly access the specific parts of the SVG and just change a specific part of it. So this is also very, very cool. Uh, and the last one I will show you, as I said, feel free to download this and, and play around with it. It's the, that you can use shaders which is very cool. And obviously, this is not, uh, this implies quite a lot of work because you have to code the shader, as you can imagine. But the compatibility of this is multi-platform. So you can use this on any platform. And I'm going to quickly show you that, that I'm not lying. Um, let's open, because I'm on a Mac, let's open PA server. With PA server, what we do, if you haven't used it, it, it give us, oh, I had it open already, sorry. Um, what it lets us do is to execute it in a remote machine, in this case, uh, Mac OS, but you can use this as well with Windows or Linux if you're compiling for Linux. So we connect remotely to PA server. In this case, we're connecting to the port 64211. And we need to configure this um, in uh, platforms here and specify uh, to which platform we're aiming for. 
So in this case, my MacBook is a Mac, uh, is an ARM, is a M1 uh, MacBook. So I'm a la I'm capable of uh, compiling for ARM straight away from from Red Studio. So let's compile this, and I already have configured here the platform. So just so you can see. No, it wasn't platform. It's edit Antonio here. So I'm, I'm aiming for the IP or web IPA servers running and the port uh, I've mentioned. So we can test the connection and connect successfully. And now I just compile straight away to Mac OS. And in a few seconds, <clears throat> because now this is going through the network, it's going to take a few seconds. But eventually, we're going to see the application being run in here on, on Mac OS. You can use this as well. But there you go. We have the application, and this is fully Mac OS native. And if we access the, let's say, the control, so we can see the well, paint box. We didn't see the paint box uh, earlier, which is quite cool that you can draw straight away here in the in the application. But we can see, for example, the SVGs. Um, uh, what is the oh, animated? Sorry, the Telegram sticker. We can see the same one, same thing. We can resize this, and it's fully. Uh, responsive, uh, or the very cool one that is the runtime effect, the shader. So this is exactly the same code, but now we're running it on uh, on Mac OS. If we had time, I would be more than happy to show this being running on Android and iOS, etc. But unfortunately, we we don't have uh, many hours. But I guess you can get the gist uh, of the concept and how battery smooth, it works, even, even though it's compiled to multiple platforms. OK, uh, as I mentioned, um, please download this demo and this library. It's going to be available natively in uh, version 12. But you can start uh, developing your application with it, and it will be fully compatible as well with uh, RAD Server 12. OK, let's see. Uh, let's create, just in case you're not familiar with um, FileMonkey at all, uh, let's create quickly um, a new application. How do we create a FileMonkey application? Well, you need to come here to New, and then you, you need to choose Multi-Device Application. Here, you're going to see this wizard that will let you choose between different, um, uh, let's say, templates. But uh, for this demo, let's go with a blank one. And now we have here available what it looks. I mean, the thing I want to leave clear is if you're familiar with BCL, this doesn't change much. I mean, there's a few key concepts that once you you uh, learn about them, it's pretty much the same thing. And the code is exactly, it's Pascal, it's exactly the same code. So don't be scared of trying FMX thinking that it's a fully different technology, because it's not. Um, Probably you're very familiar if you're coming from the VCL world uh, with panels is usually what you use to uh, define uh, your layout. But here on FireMonkey, we have um, multiple other tools because obviously we need to be more aware of the size of the screen because maybe we want to develop the application for a phone, but also we want to make it compatible with uh, an iPad. So obviously the screen size is very different and we want to show things uh, in different positions or adapt them to the screen. So if, if we search here in the tool palette uh, for layouts, we can see that we have uh, quite more options when it comes to VCL. Do you still have panels? If you feel comfortable with panels and you want to keep using panels, uh, not a problem. You can search here for panels, and you still have your uh, trusty panels. But usually, I recommend to you just uh, go straight to layouts because it will uh, allow you to to do some extra extra uh, functionality that you cannot accomplish with with panels. So layout, if you think about it, is just like a container uh, that you can use uh, and align as well as you're usually uh, familiar with. But here on FireMonkey, we have multiple extra alignments uh, that probably did not sound as familiar. We have a uh, fit left, fit right. Uh, we have top. We have mo most top. Um, again, 
we don't have time to go through all all of them but they are there to allow you to get a better uh, experience when it comes to defining the UI and and leave that prepared for for multi uh, multi size screens. So let's do something very very simple. Let's align this to the top and then let's drop and regular T edit. This is just a T edit and let's drop as well a button. Right. And for example, what we can do is put this like here. Let's align this to the right and this one to the whole client. So I'm doing this ex extremely ugly. So excuse me because I just have a few minutes. But the one I wanted to show you, which is also very cool, is the grid panel layout. Uh, this is very handy when it comes to creating uh, multi-screen uh, uh, alignments. So if we make this to the whole client, we can see that now we have four panels inside this one, or four layouts. But we can also customize that. So, And also you can do this programmatically in case you want to create extra uh, columns or remove them based on the resolution of the screen. You can do that as well programmatically. But uh, you can define this, maybe if you work with Bootstrap or something like that, let's see that it's very similar because we assign a percentage to each column and then that adapts automatically based on the resize of the screen. So we, for example, you could put here, let's say uh, a button, which doesn't make any sense, but uh, the idea would be to put another layout inside here so then you can re Let's actually quickly do it because it makes more sense. Let's put a regular layout in here. Then we have a layout. In here, you could even uh, align things and make it more complex. What I usually recommend is you, you put a layout in there, you align that to the client, and then you're free to create here whatever you want. Let's say you can put drop the, a grid, and now you have fully control of how to align that in there. We can put this to the bottom and then adapt this. I, I, I mean, I, I, I hope you're getting the, the, the gist of how this thing is working. Oops. Oh, damn keyboard. Let me see. There you go. Um, so yeah, we can put a button and then we can keep adding more components and layouts and everything stays uh, aligned correctly. Um, so. Also, actually, I'm going to put a drop down menu because I really like to show that one. It's a combo box, excuse me. Okay, we have a combo box here. And let's compile this monstrosity of an app so you can just see how this looks fairly Windows to me. Uh, because we've created this layout, we can see that it adapts, etc. Uh, we have the combo box that uh, I, I actually need to add one item, so it works. But yeah, you can you can see that this is a, a initially looks very 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 Windows. Um, let's quickly add an item here. This one. Uh, but up here, this this is very cool as well because you don't need to compile to a specific application to see how it how it will look. For example, if you want to see how this will look on Mac OS, you just need to select the style here, and then you can get an idea of how this will look compiled to Mac OS. Same thing for iOS, and same thing for Android. Um, as you can see, the buttons change automatically, and if we add an extra one, which is quite, um, is the tab control, and we just add, some tabs here, a couple of tabs, and let's align this to the client as well. Um, so you can see this is a tab, the same uh, system as you would find the VCL. Now we're on Android. But if we change this to Windows, you can see that we get the Windows, uh, the Windows style. But if you go to Mac OS, we get the Mac style. Um, this is 
something that is, I mean, it's unparalleled. This is extremely powerful that you don't need to be concerned about the styles and everything adapts automatically. And the coolest bit is if you go to iOS, the tabs go to the bottom because that's how iOS tabs work. Uh, tabs are at the bottom, they're not on the top as an Android or, or Windows. So you don't even need to define that you want to an iOS go to the bottom because they do it automatically. Um, so let's quickly compile this now. Yes, what's the time? Okay, we have a few minutes. Um, just as you can see on Mac OS, And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to show you another very cool demo I wanted, but um, I can show you something else. Um, so yeah, we can see that now the application is fully Mac styled, and we don't need to do absolutely anything. I didn't. We haven't coded one thing yet. Obviously, we have no business logic defined at all. But uh, I guess you 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 get the idea. Of course, you can put here in this button and you can do show message and say, hey. So if we compile this now on Mac OS, we're going to get a Mac OS, uh, Mac OS message. Let me close this one. And in the meantime, even though this is going to take a few seconds, there you go. So we do this on message and we're getting a Mac OS uh, show message. Same thing if we compile this for Linux, uh, sorry, Linux for Windows, we're gonna get a message dialog as we usually get on, on Windows. So I hope you are getting how uh, powerful this is because obviously the amount of components that we have uh, for uh, FunMonkey are quite broad, uh, we can, get the authenticator, a biometric authenticator to, to use it on mobile platforms. Uh, and it will be automatic. We don't need to, because it, it, it's that simple. Okay, I have to be on a mobile application. Give me a sec. We have the biometric authenticator. And then it has two events, which I think is hilarious because you don't need to do absolutely anything. You just want to uh, create, uh, define an event in case the uh, authentication has been successful or if it fails, that's it. The rest uh, has been done by the components itself. Um, obviously we have some properties uh, uh, we can uh, customize a bit, the biometric strength and stuff like that. You can check the documentation to you know everything about this. But I, it's just to show you, because this was introduced in 11.3, this new component, but same thing for the camera and for Bluetooth and for GPS, you have a component specifically for that functionality. And again, you can just customize this, um, and but don't be concerned about what's going on uh, behind the scenes. Okay, um, I'm going to, connect actually i also wanted to show you this because um I'm going to connect my android phone to the, the computer and i'm going to open the terminal another tab now damn it give me a sec i execute a pa server again i need to execute this application and hopefully you're going to be able to see my uh, Android phone. And here I have, uh, again, the Skia for Delphi application. It's the same one that we've been using. As you can see, we have exactly the same functionalities. Uh, we can use the runtime effects and we can see the shader. So exactly the same functionality, with same code base, everything working exactly the same. But I wanted to show you some other applications I've created here on my phone. I think I have the, um, this one. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Hopefully, I'm going to have time. Because I created an application myself from scratch to use in uh, live events. Um, I have a couple of slides to talk about it very, very briefly. 
but yeah, this is like a real demo. This is not just uh, some fish as you probably have seen in multiple times when it comes to Delphi demos. This is a very cool application I developed uh, to show that it's possible to have a VCL application connected to um, to uh, a, a database in a server and then add in extra functionality using that server. But that's a topic for another day. Um, I actually just finished uh, rewriting the first part of the RAT server uh, technical guide. So just go to our blog. Uh, I created a uh, post uh, a week ago or something like that. And you can download for free the RAT server and the uh, technical guide. Uh, it's a very cool um, uh, technology to add extra functionality to your VCL application in case you don't want to um, go to the cloud or, or use some other technologies and still stick to to Rad Studio. So yeah, basically, <clears throat> excuse me, I created an application, uh, a VCL application, and then with a VCL application and using fast reports, I uh, created the, the tags, as you can see here, that in these tags with a QR code that the, the salespeople could scan with their phones and then get the details of the, of the attendees and mark uh, what they're interested in and which products so they can send information afterwards, also take notes and also uh, control who's attending the event, who's not. Even I added extra functionality for headphone, trans uh, uh, live translation headphones to see who hasn't returned them. But yeah, uh, let's quickly go through this slide, which is, this is probably something you're very familiar with. We have a bunch of computers that they connect to a server using a VCL application. And in this case, uh, we had a, I created a, a Ubuntu server with interbase. So obviously, that could be any database you prefer. Not a problem because I use FireDAC, so you can connect to any pretty much any database. And then we have the, um, the phones, tablets, laptops, etc. So what I did is I created an extra layer with RAT server that exposed some of that data from the main database. Not all the data, uh, but some of it. So that allowed, um, conceptually, it would allow you to still use your VCL application and the users using it um, keep using that application because they're happy with it. <coughs> but using that server, we added that external layer so we could connect to some of the data and securely because we implemented as well uh, user and password access. Uh, and also we created a web app using Sencha, but the, unfortunately we don't have to see that now. But I wanted to quickly show you um, the application. Let's close this abomination. And this should be yeah. So when this uh, RAT server is not the main topic of this uh, webinar, so I'm just going to compile it uh, quickly. I already had it running, actually. Yeah, there you go. It's, uh, okay, let's close it and let's run it. Let's do things right. Um, okay, this is RAT server. As I said, we don't have time to go through this. If you want uh, documentation, uh, we have plenty of it. Um, but the one I wanted to show you, we have the internal app that connects. This is purely a VCL application. And this is pretty much, oh yeah, I need to open, sorry. It's um, this one. Now it should work. I mean, I wish I could have two hours to talk about this application because uh, I even shared code between FireMonkey, some business logic. Uh, I shared it between VCL and FireMonkey just to prove that the code is fully compatible even between platforms. So not, 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 sorry, not only between platforms, but even between VCL and FireMonkey applications. Um, so this is a very standard uh, VCL application. I'm gonna go through all the details again. Uh, also, if you're still using VCL, please use the styles <laughs> because you can give a very, very cool uh, more than five 
to your VCL applications with just uh, one line of code. And hopefully you can charge us your customers for, for this uh, feature you've been working on for months. Uh, well, jokes apart. Um, yeah, there's a basic uh, VCL application that probably resonates. Uh, we have the stuff so we can create the users that will have access to our application. We create the events, the attendees, we assign the attendees to the events. We have products uh, that the attendees could be interested in. And now let's go to the FireMonkey application, which is this one. OK, if we execute this first on Windows, We have this, I'm already logging in with the default user and password. I, I define in my uh, the registry just for convenience and in, in, in dev mode, but this will show uh, uh, authentication uh, login window. Or, and once you're logged in, every time you access the application, it will re uh, uh, request your biometric uh, authentication as well. So just as you quickly, as you can quickly see here is very much uh, an application where you can see, uh, sorry, the event, you access the event, then you see the attendees of the event, you can search for the attendees as well, all this, as you can see here in the RAT server log, every time we move, we are getting requests in, in the back end. Uh, all this is going through JSON responses, uh, just a standard uh, REST API. Um, but yeah, we can mark who has attended. We can check the attendee details. Uh, we can take notes as well. Um, which products they're interested in. So it's a, and also we have the camera that probably you're not gonna be able to see because uh, I'm on my laptop, but again, there you go. This is the camera. Um, but uh, that, that's a camera on Windows. Uh, so this one worked on Windows, but we can use that as well with the same component as I mentioned on uh, Win uh, Android and iOS and Linux as well and Mac OS. So quickly, I just want to show you this same application running on my Android phone. So we have the internal application right here. Now you're gonna see on the screen, but you're gonna see a flash at the bottom, which is my uh, identification with my fingerprint, and now we're in the application. Uh, the functionality, as you can see, well, in this case, because I define a role-based system as well, this user only has access to one event in particular, but you can see that the functionality and how it looks is pretty much the same, but some bits, for example, the tabs in this case, they go to the bottom, as we mentioned before, and they look like um, Android. We have also the burger menu, I didn't mention, but this one works as well on Windows, not a problem. And for example, the combo box, if I tap the combo box, we get a combo box that looks like Android. And if we're on iOS, it will be one of those that go to the bottom and we scroll um, through the options. So yeah, this is, uh, and the camera. I can also access the camera. And as you can see now, you probably should be seeing my screen as well. So I can even turn on and off the, <laughs> the torch. So uh, I developed this in a month-ish, like the whole thing. So, and I'm not saying that I'm, I'm an amazing developer. I'm just saying that this is a very, very productive technology and you can accomplish not just theoretical demos as I usually, usually see in this kind of webinars, but this is actually, we are actually, uh, we're using for real in events and salespeople are using it and we're keeping track of who is attending to the event. Uh, then afterwards we send emails with the specific interests of each attendee and salespeople can keep track of their notes so they remember uh, the details of each attendee, et cetera. And we even have little filters here to filter who hasn't returned the headphones yet. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, um, of course I would love to, to 
show you some of the internals of this application, how, how it was built. But unfortunately, we don't have time for that. But uh, obviously, this is more like a proper application. We, we have frames that I didn't have time to talk about, which is also very cool technology for, for, uh, for, for FireMonkey. Let's say so they're like components you can create uh, more like if you have used React or Vue or something like that. If you create reusable components and then you create them live based on uh, obviously whatever you need. In this case, for example, if you remember those product buttons, well, it's just a frame. And then I clone that, uh, assign some logic to what happens when it's clicked, et cetera. So it's kind of a dumb uh, component. But anyway, um, we're very, very close to the end of the webinar. So let's jump back on the slides, if I can. Because there is just one thing I want to mention before the Q&A, uh, the app stores. Um, if you're not registered with the app stores, obviously we cannot help you with that. It, it's, it's a process that you need to go through, the verification, et cetera, until you get all the certificates and all the keys, et cetera, so you're able to upload your applications to the stores. Uh, once you're uh, certified and verified, it, the updates are much faster, but don't get too stressed <laughs> uh, the first times you try to register and upload your first application because it's I mean, I'm not saying months, but it sometimes takes weeks until the Apple and Google verify everything. We're also providing as much help as possible to, to store all the certificates and information straight away through the uh, Android Studio. So you don't need to be tinkering a lot with external compilers and stuff like that. And that's pretty much it on my side. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, presentation. Um, I, as I mentioned, I wish I had more time to show you more details, but maybe that could be a future webinar. And <laughs> we can come back and talk about the, the how this application was created, and we can go in much detail about how to use FireMonkey to develop your applications. So thank you. Well, thank you, Antonio, that, for that great presentation. That was some really cool functionality that you showed off there. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, we do have some questions, but I think we're running out of, out of time. So what we'll do uh, is that we'll make sure that we forward those questions to you and we'll make sure that the, they are answered uh, in the follow-up email that we send out to all the attendees. Okay. Uh, and, right. if, and yeah, if any of the attendees still have questions, please um, ask them and we'll make sure that um, we forward them to Antonio so that he can help us with answers to those. Yeah, please do. Uh, we'll be, I will be more than happy to answer those questions. Great, thank you. Okay. So I think we're running out of time very quickly here. So again, thank you, Antonio, for a great presentation. And My pleasure. Um,